and we are going live with questions and answers on how to use Choco. And if you have need any suggestions, you are more than um, you are more than free to quickly tune in, and I'll be free and available to answer any questions. Earlier yesterday, we received one question to ask how to use or how to do a stencil technique um, when you do shadowing. And I'm quickly going to hand the phone over to Kaylee so that she can hold the phone and that I can quickly demonstrate for you. So if you will just hold on. And we are just going to turn it around so that I can demonstrate that. There you go. Okay, so let me show you how to do a shadow stencil technique. I have a lovely video lady in front of me and a cup of coffee. Let's just move it out and let me get my prepared bread for. So to do a shadow stencil technique, Kaylee, if you can just focus on there, I'm going to first stencil with a darker color, like Danny's D. And then I'm going to go through a few questions that we frequently receive. Okay, so very little paint, as mentioned earlier this week, and we stencil with our stencil brush. Make sure you, with your free hand, you hold the stencil down. If you have questions even after this session, you are more than willing to send it to us via Facebook and we will be ready to answer them. So I'm stenciling with a darker color paint underneath. It can also be a lighter color paint, depending on what you want to create. And I'm going to stop here so that you can see the shadowing stencil effect. So once my stencil work, the bottom layer, has been done, I remove my stencil and the stencil work is done. But now I want to create a shadow effect. To create a shadow effect, you replace your stencil. You put it back in position exactly the way it was. And now important will be the size of the detail on your stencil. So you don't want to move your stencil too much, but you want to move it to create an authentic shadow effect. So your stencil needs to move up and down and it needs to move left and right, but a fraction. So let me show you. I'm going to use stencil of Paris to create my shadow effect, but you can also use a different chalk or color. So what I'm going to do, and Kaylee focus on this breadboard for me, is I'm going to move my stencil first right, tiny bit. It's more or less two and a half millimeters. I think two and a half millimeters up. So I can see, if you focus here, that my pattern still touches where I've stenciled with, with paint. I can see it through my stencil. Can you see that you can still see it? So it's not detached from the next stencil work you're going to do. I take my paint scraper, just wait a few minutes for your paint to dry. And now I spread my paste over my stencil work. So to repeat what I have done, I've moved my stencil two and a half millimeters to the right, your right, and two and a half millimeters up. And then I repeat my stencil work. Okay. 
and I made sure the stencil of Paris is done nicely, evenly, and because of the fact that my paint was still a bit wet on my stencil, when I started with the stencil of Paris, it will slightly discolor my paste, which is fine. And now I'm going to remove it. And there you have a very authentic shadow effect. Okay, so let's, I'm going to turn the camera around again. Sorry for this. Okay, and let's see. Oh, hello, Vilma. Mariki, Sandra, Daniel, Sonia, Yaku, Patrice. You're all watching. What are the questions that we often get? So one of the questions that we often receive and also send yours, yours, your questions through is how do I seal my chocolate bottles? So very important. The console jars are preserved jars. But like with jams, what we do in the factory as well, we either put a cellophane um, sleeve on top or a wax paper sleeve, and that makes the opening process just so much easier. So that you need to do the same. We also recommend it on the instructions on the lid. Once you've used your chalk or paint, clean the top rim of the jar nicely with a damp cloth, then replace either cellophane if you have, or what I like to use is glad wrap. You tear off a piece of glad wrap, place it over your bottle and seal it again. And if you seal it well, there are three things that contaminate paint, water, air, and a dirty paintbrush. So if you make sure that no air gets into your paint, what I also like to do is when I know I'm going to paint for a long time, I pour some paint out, close my chocolate jar and put it back. And then I know no unnecessary air can go in there. Air contaminates. It's the same with food, paint, anything. It gets hold of. So you want to get air. Air needs to stay out of your paint. I must tell you, it's even more daunting looking at yourself doing this video than to look at a camera. <laughs> Okay, so air needs to stay out. The next thing that's very important is water. You don't want to add water to your paint. With charcoal, you don't need to add water. So do not add water in your jar. You can, if you do a lime wash technique, add water separately, mix it into some, a different container, mix it, and then wash onto your surface. Hello, Didi. Um, Yo, I haven't seen you in a while. So the next thing that's very important and the third thing that also contaminates paint is a dirty paintbrush or dirty equipment. Make sure when you paint that your paintbrushes are clean. If you're not sure whether you're working with a clean paintbrush, rather pour some paint out and work from that container rather than dipping your paintbrush in your paint jar. And when you're done painting, very important, close it tightly that no air can be trapped inside. I still have very little bit, but the E still, from our very first Homemakers Expo, drops of um, vineyard stone in my console jars, and they're still perfect. But I always make sure that I don't contaminate my product, products. Then the next question that we received is cleaning of surfaces. Um, when do I sand and when do I don't sand? So we find sometimes that when sanding varnish surfaces, you're actually unleashing the oil trapped inside. So when, with varnish surfaces, the following tips are very important. Make sure your varnish is older than six months. Don't paint onto a varnish surface, not even with a universal undercoat before six months. It needs a curing time. And then secondly, if the varnish is still in a good condition and it has cured for six months, clean it well with lacquer thinners. What the lacquer thinners does, it cleans the surface oils so that the paint can do this, the gripping work. Choco is water-based. If there's oil on your surface, 
Choco can't grip to the surface. So very important, and this is the most crucial step, is that you clean the surfaces properly with lack of thinners before you start painting. Times when sanding are required are the following. On a previously waxed surface and on plastic surfaces, you need to sand first. The reason for that, wax is a product that disintegrates and nothing can grip to it. And plastic have an oily coating, has an oily coating on it that you first need to remove with sanding, then clean with your lacquer thinners and then start painting. So the cleaning part is the most crucial part. Make sure it's done properly. If you clean your laminated surfaces well, your previously varnished surfaces well, um, wall tile surfaces well, glass, all of those are surfaces that you clean with lacquer thinners, wait your 20 to 40 minutes, and only then do you start painting. Okay, bleeding. When does bleeding occur? What is bleeding? And how do I treat bleeding? Now, bleeding is something that happens, especially on very old furniture pieces that have received oil treatments and polishes over years. And what happens is the oil gets absorbed in the wood. You never know when, when um, bleeding is going to occur. What is bleeding? It's when you paint and yellow stains start appearing. Okay, not in all instances on old furniture this happens, but it does happen sometimes. Now, what do I do in cases like that? So you clean your surface well with lacquer thinners, you paint it, and then you see, oh, but there's yellow stains appearing. Okay, then you do the following. So you finish your painting, you allow the paint to cure for at least four hours. Allow the paint to cure for four hours. Can everybody hear me? Let, let me know if the sound is a problem. You allow the paint to cure for at least four hours. And then you apply a clear glaze coating. The clear glaze acts as a barrier between the bleeding and the, the next coat of paint you are going to apply. So when bleeding occurs, and I'm painting all furniture, and I see, oh, it's turning yellow, what I do is I allow the paint to cure for four hours. I paint my glaze onto that surface. Some instances, only the dots where I see, oh, this is a problem, the rest of the furniture item is perfectly fine, but certain areas, yellow blotches appear, on those areas, then I apply the glaze. If you're concerned that bleeding will occur on more areas, you glaze, paint the glaze on, don't dilute it as on the instructions, because this is now a barrier that we are applying. You paint the glaze on, you allow for the glaze to dry overnight. The glaze dries quickly, but let it cure overnight that all the bleeding happens, and the next day you paint on top of the glaze and then you will see no problem. No, no oil seeps through anymore. We see bleeding when painting with enamels, with PVAs. It's quite a natural thing that happens and not something that we can predict. So that's how you treat bleeding. If there are questions, please ask them. I will answer to the best of my ability. Fabrics was a question. When do I paint on fabrics? What fabrics do I paint on? And which fabrics do I just leave out? Okay. So this is a very personal thing and something that I recommend to clients all the time. If you want to paint on fabric, always test first. If you are to see whether you are going to like the texture that the paint um, leaves on top of the fabric. Paint changes the texture of fabric. Suede will not feel like suede anymore. Suede changed to a more of a leathery feel. And um, velvet becomes very hard. So velvet is something you need to decide. This is a quick fix. Am I going to paint it rather and like the item for longer, but it's going to change the surface, the feel of the fabric, or am I going to reupholster? Something that works very well with choco is faux leather. Um, seeing that the faux leather is in good condition.
sorry, I'm trying to hold the phone and talking and I'm moving my hands. So sorry if there are movement. Um, so first of all, test. See if you like the feel of the paint on the surface, on the fabric surface. Second, natural fabrics work best. Linen works beautifully. Cotton works beautifully. We stencil our shirts for expose, our denims for expose, and our napkins, my napkins are stenciled. How do I wash it? Okay, once the paint is dry, you iron it at the back, and then you leave it um, until you want to wash. If you want to wash, hand wash in cold water. Hello, Tinas. Explain you here. So hand wash in cold water. That applies to surfaces like your napkins, your t-shirts, denims, um, pillowcases. If it's a natural item like a linen, works beautifully to stencil onto them. You don't need to throw them away. Tablecloths work beautifully. If they are natural woven fabrics, to stencil onto them. You will never ever have to throw a pillowcase or a tablecloth away again. No sealant is required. You simply stencil, turn it to the back when the stencil work is dry, iron, and when you want to wash, hand wash in cold water. Upholsteries, upholstered surfaces are something different. And those are the surfaces that you will test to first see whether you like the feel and the touch of the paint on the surface. Suede works well. The texture of suede changes to a more of a leathery feel. Something that can also occur on, on upholstered surfaces is cracks, hairline cracks. Hairline cracks will appear if there's a lot of movement in your, um, up, on your upholstered surface. So the more the stiff, the stiffer the surface is upholstered, the greater the success. Because paint can only bend and stretch to a certain extent. So just bear all of that in mind. If you're uncertain, send me a picture and I will tell you immediately, yes, do it. Or test first whether you're going to see or no, don't do it. Um, I'll be quite honest with that advice. Okay, next thing. Winifred, welcome. The next thing that I want to explain to you is how to apply the clear glaze. Now, the clear glaze is a water-based pure acrylic sealant and what it does it gives you a water resistant uv resistant surface how to apply it it's easy and if streakiness appears it's easy to fix i'm going to tell so on the instructions of the glaze it's important to allow the gla the, the painted surface to cure for at least four hours when we do kitchens for clients or wall tiles for clients or um, larger surfaces, we always leave the paint to dry overnight, like today in Hutting. It's a cloudy and a cold day and the curing process on everything just takes longer. So to be on the safe side on larger surfaces, we allow the paint to cure overnight and then we start the glazing the next day. So how the glazing work is as follows. It leaves a subtle satin finish, but even though it leaves a subtle satin finish, you can still manipulate the sheen level on your surface. If you like a matte finish, you don't want to change the matte feel and finish on your surface, you can apply, you can add more water to your glaze. I won't add more than 50% water to the glaze, then I know it's still a good sealant, but then it, the, the sheen level has dropped. So the more water you apply, the less the sheen level. We recommend 30% water on the lid, but if you want a more matte finish, you can dilute it with half water, half glaze. How, how to do it? Now, please, we have a YouTube channel, Choco Paint, where there are numerous videos where we show everything that you need to know, step by step how it's done. And then we are an amazing team. Um, Danny Hal, Jakob Klopper, Lee Harling, Karen, we are all on Facebook. So if you have any questions, 
we will answer them gladly. And if you need advice, you can easily ask or send us an email. And we are there day and night to assist with anything that you need from us. Go have a look on our YouTube channel if you want to see how this is done. Let me explain the glaze process. So, you fill out now your kitchen doors to dry overnight. You mix your 30% water with your glaze. I like to use an ice cream tub, so I three parts glaze, one part water, damp, clean cloth. So you dampen your cloth with water, remove the excess water and dip this in your glaze mixture and your, t your cloth is as big as a kitchen towel. Then you move the sides away so that it sits like a ball in the palm of your hand. And in a well-lit space, you apply your glaze by wiping it onto your painted surface. You will immediately, immediately see if you have missed a spot. Hello, Sonia, if you have missed a spot. And then you wipe over them. If you've completed your glazing process and you see, oh my heck, I left stripes or there's streakiness on the surface, you simply apply another coat by wiping it. Work with gloves. Um, it's, easier to get, it's easier to get your hands clean. Uh, another tip, if you want to remove glaze from your hands, take a long soapy bath with a glass of wine, relax, water does wash it off. Um, so that's how easy it is. Go watch the videos, it will make sense and if you need assistance, we are there to help. The next thing, nice exciting tip, we've received questions on how to paint larger flat surfaces. So for a larger flat surface, you make use of a mohair, let me just turn it around so that you can see clearly, a mohair roller and the size is a 225 millimeter. So larger flat surfaces, this is your best friend. How to use the mohair roller. So the mohair roller you need to wash with some water first and then it is crucial to dry it well. If you don't dry it well, it will leave watering marks on your surface. So I shake it out and then I take a cloth and I wipe it as dry as can be. If you shake it, no water should go out. But what the water does, it um, removes the, the bolikis, the frills on the inside, so it just removes anything that's um, loose on the, on the roller, and it also opens the pores right at the core of the mowy roller so that you can evenly apply your paint. This leaves a beautiful, even finish on a large flat surface. I have painted Kaylee's um, laminated or melamine bedroom doors, building cover doors, with Darvet, um, with a Maui roller. And it was so, so easy. You simply roll, also important, always wait in between coats for your paint to dry. Very important. So once your first coat is on, allow proper time for your first coat to dry. You will see the paint dries rather quickly, anything from 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the climate and depending on the area where you stay. Coastal areas, things do take longer to dry. Wait your 20 to 40 minutes and then apply your second coat. That's very important. Then I receive numerous questions on what brushes to use. It's very important, it's like an artist. An artist will always recommend you to use good paint equipment. And the same is if you want an even smooth application on your surface, use good equipment. Paint, and especially charcoal, don't leave streakiness. But if you are going to use a brush with hard bristles um, or very thick plastic bristles, that leaves a streakiness, a lines behind once you've painted. I like to use Hamilton's brushes. So there's the brush. And then also it's important to put on enough paint on your brush. I'm quickly going to turn this around. Um, 
I'm just getting assistance from the family members and I'm going to show you. So I'm going to dip my Hamilton's brush, there it is, although, here it is, although it's new, as long as you make sure after each use, your brush has been washed with water while, the water, while your paint is still wet, wash it immediately. I always have water on my table. If I know I'm done with a brush, I put it in the water immediately. Wash it, dry it well, and put the sleeve back on. Then you know it will stay beautiful as long as you need it. So a good quality paint brush is crucial to a good quality paint job. Let me quickly, I'm just going to hand the phone to Yaku and move it around. Okay, so here's a surface. It's a breadboard, um, one that I used on Tuesday to do the stenciling technique on. So I put paint on my paint brush. Not too little paint, because too little paint will also make streaks and then you paint. So enough paint on your paint brush, good quality paint brush. And that's how easy it is. I hope this makes sense. Okay. I'm going to turn it around again. Okay, what tools to use when doing stencil work? Um, when do I use a foam roller? When do I use a stencil brush? Okay, so a stencil brush, this is what it looks like. I've stenciled with it before. Is a brush that works well for smaller surfaces. Can you imagine using that brush to stencil an entire wall? you will go mad. It will be worse than lockdown, I promise. And for larger surfaces, use a mohair roller. Ah, oh, sorry, this is a foam roller. Use a foam roller. So the big, big tip and big rule with stencil work, and this is something that I said um, earlier this week, is the less paint you use, the greater the success. You can rather apply a second coat and then you know no leaking has occurred um, underneath your stencil. Antique glaze, next question. When do I use antique glaze? How do I use antique glaze and where? Next week, Tuesday, 1.30. Same time, same place, in your house and in mine, we will be having a tutorial on how to use the antique glaze. I'm going to show you step by step how to do it on top of Stencil of Paris and on surfaces with crevices and um, grooves. And I'll be showing you how to wash onto a surface with various chalk or colors. Now the antique glaze are meant for surfaces that has, or surfaces that have crevices and grooves, especially embellishments, stunning to use. Um, embellishments are the, those carved out items. It's also stunning to use on our stencil of Paris after you've painted a coat of chalk on the dry stencil of Paris. Beautiful to use. I'll show you Tuesday exactly how that is done. And then it is um, also nice on edges of surfaces. When you want to create an antique finish on a flat surface, we recommend to use various chalk or colors and to wash them onto a surface. Okay, I'll show you Tuesday exactly how it's done. I, this was a mouthful and a lot of tips. Um, I hope it makes sense and we are available. If you need to send more questions, please send them. We'll gladly answer all of them. I hope you all stay positive. I think this is the crucial part of this entire lockdown. Don't let your mind run away with you. Stay positive, stay productive. Put your lipstick on and your perfume every morning, okay? Promise? And then we are going to keep on inspiring you. Um, I must tell you the golf clubs was not a great success. 
Yaku did not think I was cute painting his golf clubs. So don't try this at home. Um, but I'm sure he'll always remember me now when he goes to the golf course. We tried to cut grass yesterday and I must tell you gardening is fabulous, but I like painting more. So I ended up painting the facade of our house, a beautiful green, and then my paint ran out. So it needs to stay like this now till after lockdown. I don't think Yaku loves me that much anymore. But most important, stay productive. Make your list of things you want to accomplish every day. And then I'll see you all again Tuesday next week, half past one. And send those questions. We'll gladly answer. Love you all. Keep well. Bye.